human race has always been obsessed by things it can't understand. The more elusive the answer, the more we try to find it. The Society for Psychical Research has compiled hundreds of reports since it was founded in 1882. These are just some of them, proving the Society's members believe the existence of paranormal phenomena. But after more than a century, they still haven't been able to find out how or why. Our stories tonight are as strange as any the Society has ever encountered. We'll meet a woman who works alongside doctors to practice astonishing healing powers, and we'll hear from the patients she has apparently cured. First, this particular report was compiled by a group investigating ghost stories at the fortress which has guarded England's shores longer than any other, from the Iron Age to the Second World War. High above the famous White Cliffs on the south coast, Dover Castle is the kind of place you might expect to attract ghost stories. Staff there take them with a pinch of salt, but more recent events have made them take their unearthly guests much more seriously. Nicknamed Hellfire Corner, damp and eerie. There are three and a half miles of these tunnels carved through the cliffs during World War II. Gloomy or not, today they are the favorite tourist attraction in this busy ferry port. Leslie Simpson has guided thousands of people on their plunge into history, but there's one tour he'll never forget. Um, I had a group of about 20 people. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll just follow me through now, please. We came into the repeater station. I brought the group up to the barrier. I stand on a step where I can overlook the group. You're now in the Defence Telecommunications Network Station, DTN. I play we call the this the repeater station. Information. All lines entering the headquarters came through a narrow well shaft, 150 feet below this room. I noticed this lady, she was very intent. And she suddenly looked very alarmed and she fell down and slipped down onto her knee. I'm okay. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. But the lady wasn't really fine, as Leslie found out at the end of the tour. Thanks very much. Glad you enjoyed the tour. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks for coming. Are you okay now? You didn't hurt yourself in there, did you? No, I'm fine. But. Well, this is going to sound very strange, but I think I ought to tell you what happened down there. Find that on the level above. She explained that she'd been watching a man. She had a uniform on, a naval uniform, down at the far end of the repeater station. And she thought he belonged here, part of the tour, tinkering with the equipment. It was essential that this equipment work. She then she got alarmed because he started to walk towards the group. He was walking quite fast, he came down the second small flight of steps and he just walked straight through the barrier and right through her. This sighting is only one of many in a complex which spans three eras. The Hellfire Corner tunnels, the old gun rooms built to fight off Napoleon's threatened invasion, and the ancient castle where William the Conqueror once stayed. All have reports of inexplicable goings on. Well, I've lost count of the number of times that visitors and my staff have told me of strange noises and mysterious figures they've seen. Two Americans that were visiting the underground works and after they left, they mentioned to the guides of the appropriate sound effects that we had down there. But they, there were no sound effects in the underground works. Could these be the sounds the American couple heard? Sounds of the Second World War, when Hellfire Corner was the communication center monitoring the threat of enemy attack in the channel. Bombproof and impregnable, the evacuation of Dunkirk was planned here. Hundreds of people lived and worked inside the cliff base. The tunnels were sealed for half a century before being opened up as a museum. Even now, visitors are allowed round only with supervision. Some would say, for good reason. I had a tour group of about 25 to 30 people, and the tour had been going well until we reached the repeater station. I noticed a father and daughter standing slightly away from the rest of the group. 150 feet below this room, 
connecting with the main distribution frame behind the desks. The girl appeared to be in communication with somebody who appeared invisible to me and her father was looking on interestedly. Because of the and then all of a sudden the father disappeared out of the repeater station. This equipment worked at all times. At the very rear of the tunnel is the Can you stay with the rest of the group, please? Where 24 GPO engineers of course the summit. Karen tried to forget the incident and carried on with her tour. Just before we move into the next room, ladies and gentlemen, a piece of light-hearted information for you. This room is supposed to be the most haunted room in Hellfire Corner. <laughs> yes, I know, and I've just seen the ghost. Uh, at that point, I thought we got a bit of a one here and dismissed what he said. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to follow me. He was very casual about the whole thing, but the girl was very withdrawn and shaken. She looked in shock, in fact. Karen realised something very unusual had happened, so she took down the details. He said his name was Bill Billings, and he said he was killed when he was assembling uh, an amplifier rack or something. I thought that they had definitely seen someone down here. Despite such testimonies, some of the castle staff are quite sure that the reason for it all is a perfectly natural one. After eight years of taking groups around the castle, Philip Wyburn Brown thinks he knows what's behind the apparently abnormal activities. The building is 800 years old. It's built high on the cliff. It is subject to a lot of uh, wind and air currents up here. So I think a lot of it is very much the, the natural phenomena of the building itself. So could it all just be a combination of natural atmospherics and overactive imaginations? Local investigators have done a scientific stakeout of the castle and its many tunnels and passages on three all-night vigils. Everybody happy with the groups? We brought a team of 16 people into Dover Castle, divided the team into pairs working to a very strict ship rotor. We brought in very sophisticated equipment such as a high-tech computerised sensing machine which senses uh, changes in temperature, uh, movement. Everybody's equipped with tape recorders, thermometers, video cameras. Each pair were given a certain location to work on. Group H, Sue Nichols and Keith Akers, were stationed in a passageway with their tape recorder. We'd been sat there about five hours when suddenly there was uh, an ominous bang. Unable to believe their ears, they played back the tape. And we knew there was no doors anywhere about. There was uh, nobody else near us. And then, the investigators say, they didn't just hear what they claimed to be poltergeist activity, they saw it. At approximately two o'clock in the morning, my partner and myself had a loud bang in this room, and we investigated this door here, um, found it was to be locked, and moved away approximately ten feet, and there was this huge bang behind us, which made us both jump out of our skins. We turned around, quite petrified, to see the door still vibrating madly. The next time it happened, the investigators were determined to get proof. Chris Cherry, a master at the University of Kent, trained a video camera on the door. The noise was quite tremendous, and all those tapestries above our heads started swaying. Um, and this was rather extraordinary. We thought we got a paranormal phenomenon and I very stupidly yelled out, we've got it! And of course that screwed the whole thing up and it, it ceased. Each team who were working in the keep thoroughly checked the area out and we could find no apparent natural reason 
for the door to run at all. So what could be the cause of the events at Dover Castle? Michael Bromley is a psychic who claims he can tune into departed spirits. He's never been here before, so what will he find in Hellfire Corner? This area is very powerful and very strong. I would expect that at different times people walk through here. In the repeater station, Michael came up with a name. I've just been given the name Helen for what reason? But the castle official watching Michael Bromley wasn't impressed. He started talking about Helen, and there just wouldn't have been women in that area. So I, I became very sceptical and, and just didn't believe what he was saying. It was just, just didn't gel, just wasn't right. However, a few days after we filmed Michael Bromley, another visitor, an Australian tourist who'd only just arrived in Britain, astonished everyone. I told the tour guide what I'd seen while I was in this room, how a ghostly figure had come running up towards me. Uh, he was blonde, he was wearing navy blue. Uh, he said his name was Samuel, and he was asking me questions about a woman called Helen. He was very agitated and wanting to find out about where Helen was. When she came to me and told me about Helen, you, you really could have just knocked me down with a feather. It was amazing, really. It, uh, it sort of changed my attitude, really, to the place. Well, I imagine it would. And it's not the first time that Michael Bromley's psychic information has made an impact. He's previously been employed as official psychic to the Olympic Games, helping police to sniff out security loopholes. Strange, but true. After the break, more mysterious powers. The doctors who refer their patients for healing that some describe as a miracle. It lasted for decades, it became a national legend, and investigating it was the case of a lifetime for Harry Price, Ghostbuster Supreme. Borley Rectory, in the tiny East Anglian hamlet whose name it bears, was once known as the most haunted house in England. Many people, five successive rectors, their wives and families, neighbours and visitors, all apparently saw things there. And the legend lives on. I've been involved with Borley for over 40 years, 27 years as editor of the local paper. And in every year of those 40 years, something has been reported as happening at Borley. There's nothing there, there's no shop, there's no pub. In fact, the last place that you'd expect to see a stream of visitors. So how and why has the quiet of the English countryside been so disrupted? Ever since Borley Rectory was built in 1863, reports have abounded of strange whispering a ghostly presence, and mysterious so-called accidents. It all began with the daughters of the first vicar. And a truly haunting vision. At the end of the garden, they saw a figure, its head bowed as if in prayer. One of the sisters stepped forward, but as she did, it seemed to vanish into thin air. Peter Underwood, who's been investigating Borley for 40 years, recalls meeting the sisters. They were much travelled and uh, intelligent and educated people. They weren't fools, and they certainly wouldn't lower themselves to uh, make stories up to impress other people. The legend established claims continued of strange happenings at Borley Rectory. Two decades later, it was the turn of the Reverend Eric Smith and his wife. They described more voices, footsteps and servant bells ringing of their own accord. Then while tidying a cupboard, Mrs. Smith made a gruesome discovery. Wrapped in brown paper, a skull. Beginning to doubt their sanity, the Smiths asked a national newspaper to investigate. This story could run and run. It seems everyone around here has seen or heard of something. Harry Price? You mean the psychic expert? The newspaper called in the ghost-busting services of Harry Price. Reverend Smith and Mrs. Smith. Oh. Harry was a former engineer whose marriage to a rich wife meant he could spend his time and her money delving into the paranormal. Mostly he set out to expose psychic frauds. 
but were the events the Smiths described a fraud? And you see, you cut the wires and the bells still ring. Yes, we just... If he had any doubts about Borley, Harry Price soon experienced strange events at first hand. Did you see that? It came from upstairs, but there's no one there. Harry and the reporter had a narrow escape from a flying candlestick. But there was something of the showman in Harry Price, too. He left his paranormal collection to London University. Alan Wesencraft, who looks after it, met the man himself. I think Harry Price's enthusiasm did lead him into making exaggerated claims. Uh, he had a fertile imagination, and this would take charge, I suppose. Harry Price told his story to the world, but the Smiths had had enough. They moved out. Several vicars turned down the job before a new one could be found. The Reverend Lionel Algernon Foister was old enough to be the father of his wife, Marianne. Lovely day, and the lavender looks beautiful. Yes, it is a nice day, isn't it? Mm. It's quite quiet round here after London, though, don't you find? Life in this backwater was hardly her style, but the paranormal events were. The poor girl really craved something a little bit more exciting, and she found the excitement, I think, by playing up the idea of the haunts. Lionel, mm. look at this. What is it, dear? Pebbles under my pillow. How on earth did they get there? You must write this up in your diary. Suspicions that the old vicar was fooled by his wife might have been justified. First my collar, which I'd taken off for comfort, is thrown at me. Then a stick and a piece of coal thrown across the room. Hmm. But what about the testimony of independent witnesses? A local headmaster and magistrate, Guy Lestrange, wrote about taking tea with the foisters. The other day, the servants' bells started to ring all on their own. What was that? Jumping up, I hurried to the door and found the floor outside littered with broken crockery. Uh, it's starting to happen all over again. Mary! Yes, well, you see, you can never tell what's going to happen in this house. Let's finish our tea while our cups are still intact. Still not fully the convinced, day, the magistrate yes. returned to his Fly seat. No sooner had he done so... An appalling series of crashes took us back to the doorway. And this time, Guy Lestrange couldn't believe his eyes. Bottles were being hurled about in all directions in the hall, though nobody could be seen throwing them. Good God. When the Foisters left, Harry Price's big moment arrived. He took a year's lease on the rectory and moved in. He placed an advertisement in the Times, inviting people of leisure and intellect to assist in his investigation. Charles Wintour, later a distinguished newspaper editor, was one of those who took up the invitation. I went to Borley Rectory with an entirely open mind. I was just curious what was happening there. I was convinced that Harry Price was egging it up a bit. There was something occurring, but he was making it more so. Let's have a look Yes, this looks interesting. I think you can seal this one up. You know what? In I order to make on. certain that nobody was interfering with the house, we would place cotton thread across the doors and across the passages so that nobody could sneak up. When they returned, they found the seals intact. But on inspecting the rooms, Charles Winter and his friend found marks had appeared on the walls, scratches and indecipherable messages. On one occasion, I thought one of the pencil marks was actually moving as I saw it. It seems mad, but I think that's what I saw at the time. Harry Price reaped the rewards of his research. His findings were published in best-selling books. Borley Rectory became famous as the most haunted house in England. Until one night, there was a fire. The rectory was reduced to a ruin. Arson was suspected but could never be proved. With the rectory gone, the haunting was thought to be over. 
In any case, for many, Harry Price's exaggerations and Marianne Foister's confessions, made to investigators like Peter Underwood, had discredited the story. But was there still more to it? There were things going on at Borley long before Marianne went there. There were things going on at Borley long before Harry Price went there. And there were things happening at Borley long after Marianne left and long after Harry Price was dead. The new vicar buried bones found during the rectory demolition and began to claim new happenings across the road at Borley Church itself. He was the one more than anyone else who moved the ghost from one side of the road to the other. He was the man who said, you know, that strange things are happening in my church. I've seen things in my church. I've heard things in my church. And because he was the vicar or the rector, people believed him. It's in the medieval church that Ron Russell and other psychic investigators have continued Harry Price's work. One night, he and a small team set up tape recorders there. To our surprise, we received a series of strange, unaccountable noises on the tapes. I've no doubt in my own mind that these sounds were paranormal. And the stories of unexplained incidents continue. Just heard what, what sounded like an organ playing from inside the church. But as we went in the church, it suddenly stopped. To our utter amazement, there was not a soul in the church. The organ console was closed and padlocked. Once we were inside the church, we carried on looking round when I was aware of the sound of pebbles falling down on the ground. I looked, but I couldn't actually see any pebbles. Like all the other claims surrounding Borley over the years, there is an explanation, but an incomplete one. Some local boys confessed that they'd been hiding in the church. One had pumped the organ up and the other had played a few bars and they then died behind the pews. Since then, though, in recent times, the church has been locked and still people are saying they're hearing the organ. What do you make of that? I don't know. Harry Price died nine years after Borley Rectory was destroyed. Almost immediately, books were published tearing his work to shreds. But expert opinion is divided. Though they agree his claims were exaggerated, many still back him. And to this day, a special library is dedicated to him at London University. And of course, Harry, wherever he is now, can't be accused of interfering in events since his death, at least not if he's uh, sitting in one of these. Good night. <laughs>